Let me just uh, say a couple words initially about why Friends of the Earth has been involved in the subject of carbon taxing and indeed looking at the tax code as a driver of behavior and the fact that from start to finish uh, it tends to reward things that are uh, polluting and considered harmful and, uh, and tends to penalize those things that are renewable, sustainable, clean, and healthy. We've got to change that. And going back a decade ago, Friends of the Earth published a book calling for a broad-based energy tax, a carbon tax with a re commensurate revenue neutral reduction in payroll taxes. And we noted that actually in our survey of the nation, people like the idea of, of that because they review, uh, they, they thought that carbon taxes was in the version of a sin tax or a harm charge, just the way we uh, penalize alcohol and tobacco. What has become clear, and in, in really in just the last few years, is that we're a lot closer uh, to major problems than we thought, even just a few years ago. Uh, we, we can see things happening um, all around the planet. The mountain glaciers all, all around the world are receding rapidly, and most of them are going to be gone within 50 years. And that's, uh, that itself is a big issue because the, in, the, in the summer and fall, those melting glaciers supply more than 50% of the water in the, the major rivers of the world, like the Ganges and Brahmaputra and, and rivers originating in the Rockies also in the Andes. Uh, we see that uh, the, the subtropics is expanding by four degrees of latitudes, having an effect on the southern United States and Mediterranean region and Australia. We see that the uh, coral reefs are under stress. Uh, they're the sites of about one-third of the species in the ocean, and they're, they're under stress because of the acidification of the ocean from CO2 and from the temperature, climate change, uh, among other things. Um, we see that the ice sheets are not stable. Greenland is losing mass at a rate of about 150 cubic kilometers per, per year, and uh, West Antarctica is also losing mass rapidly. So anyway, there, there, there's a lot of uh, clear evidence that uh, things are really uh, starting to happen. What is uh, crystal clear is that we cannot burn all of the fossil fuels, or even half. We, of the fossil fuels and put that CO2 in the atmosphere without pre creating a completely different planet, without sending the planet toward the ice-free state with sea level 250 feet higher. So, it, and it would take a while for the ice sheets to collapse and melt, but we would set the planet on a course which our, would be out of control of, for our children and grandchildren. And so we can't, we simply cannot do that. The oil and gas is very convenient fossil fuels, and you know they're going to be used. The, red, the large pools are going to be used. They're owned by Russia and Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern countries. They're going to get used, and it doesn't matter that much how fast you use them. You can slow down the rate at which you're using them a bit, but the lifetime of CO2 is very long, so you can't solve the problem by using it a bit slower you've actually got to leave most of it in the ground. And the fundamental thing that is required in order for us to move from the current um, energy systems to the post-fossil fuel era is that fossil fuels cannot continue to be the cheapest form of energy. They're only cheapest because they're not paying for the damage that they do to human health and the environment and the climate. But you have to have a higher price on fossil fuels or, or they're going to be used. As long as they're the cheapest form of energy, they're going to be used. On one matter, the two approaches are the same. They rely on higher prices for carbon-based fuels to push people and businesses to prefer less carbon intensive forms of energy and, and technologies, and to create incentives for companies to develop new technologies and less expensive ways of, of uh, generating low carbon or carbon free energy. Uh, a carbon based tax does, does this very directly, applying a levy based on the carbon content of the fuel. Cap and trade does it by providing energy producers and distributors with limited numbers of permits, that's the cap part, cap on the permits, to produce greenhouse gas emissions and allowing trading that reflects 
energy demand in order to determine the price of the permits. So they're both forms of taxes, but their effectiveness is very different. First, the price of carbon under cap and trade depends on the relationship between energy demand and the supply of permits. The supply of permits is fixed by the cap, but energy demand shifts all the time. And when it rises unexpectedly, because the summer is hotter than expected, or the winter is colder, or the economy is stronger, the price of the permits will rise sharply with it. Demand goes up, it gets near the cap, and then the price soars because there are more people who want it, uh, that is, want the right to burn energy than there are supply of permits. The same thing happens if the summer is cooler than expected, the winter milder, or the economy slower, the price of permits will fall sharply. Economically, this means that cap and trade introduces a new layer of price volatility in our energy markets, which is bad for the economy. And additional domestic volatility that will usually amplify the volatility we already have in international energy prices. That's unequivocally bad for the economy, unequivocally. More important here, it means that cap and trade doesn't produce a known and reliable price for carbon. And that undermines the basic strategy of getting people to shift away from carbon-based fuels. It's even more important for businesses considering large investments to redo their energy infrastructure or critically to develop new climate-friendly fuels and technologies. If they don't know what the price of carbon is going to be a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, um, and, in get, and again, cap and trade inherently produces large price volatility, uh, that is volatility in the price of carbon, as we've seen in both the European trading scheme and the acid rain program. It's much harder to figure out whether those large investments will make economic sense because you don't know what the price is going to be. By contrast, a carbon-based tax is relatively transparent, making it harder for greenhouse gas producing interests to finagle a sweetheart deal at our expense. Doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it a little harder. Equally important, a carbon-based tax deals with people's resistance to bearing these additional costs directly. It applies the tax in a revenue-neutral way by recycling the revenues as tax relief, for example, through cuts in the payroll tax or through lump sum payments to households. That way, we change the relative price of energy based on its impact on the climate without making people poorer. Cap and trade creates a trillion dollars or so in new financial instruments, that's the permits, to be traded on the financial markets. When they talk about the trading, where do you think that's gonna happen? It's gonna happen on Wall Street. Here's what we know about how this would work. First, they would, they would be the focus of large-scale speculation because speculators make their money off of price changes off of volatile prices, and cap and trade inherently, unavoidably, and inevitably produces high price volatility. Is there any sense at all in creating a trillion dollars in new financial instruments which would, would immediately produce derivatives and derivatives of those derivatives when we know the economic risks for the rest of us that such markets involve when the underlying asset is basic to the economy, like mortgages and energy, and subject to bubbles and large price swings? These are exactly the ingredients that produce the financial meltdown. In late May of 2008, the government of British Columbia enacted a carbon tax on fossil emissions from fossil fuels. It was part of its, the government's a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 33 percent by 2020, an aggressive target. It's a broad enough tax base to cover, in British Columbia, 77 percent of their greenhouse gas emissions, according to recent figures from the Ministry of Finance. So this creates a comprehensive tax base, and very importantly, <coughs> the tax has only very limited and policy-based exemptions from the general rule that all fossil fuels will be taxed. It has, for example, an exemption for exports because those fuels will be burned outside of British Columbia, an exemption for interjurisdictional travel by air, um, over which the government probably does not have legal authority, and an exemption for feedstocks, which won't be burned. 
But very importantly, um, it does not have any special exemptions for specific fuels or specific users. Um, it's not riddled with special interest exceptions. It's retained its breadth and its comprehensive character. The tax went into effect July 1 of last year, 2008, at the rate of $10 per ton of carbon dioxide. And that tax rate will go up by $5 each year until it reaches $30 per ton in 2012. So since we're just past the first anniversary of the tax, um, the tax is now playing out at $15 per ton of carbon dioxide. Again, no special tax rates for particular fuels, just one flat rate that applies across the board. What does this rate translate into? For gasoline, the first year of the tax, it was $0.09 cents a gallon. When it's fully phased in at $30 a ton, that will go up to about $0.27 cents per gallon of gas on top of the other provincial gas taxes. The British Columbia proposal is a revenue-neutral carbon tax. That means that all of the revenue that the tax generates is given back to the taxpayers, primarily in the form of a variety of different kinds of income tax relief. There's a refundable tax credit for low-income taxpayers, and it's paid out quarterly so that taxpayers don't have to wait till they file their annual return to get the benefit. There are lower individual income tax rates and lower business tax rates. And there's also an interesting twist to the requirement of revenue neutrality. The law says that the finance minister is, is charged with ensuring that each year all of the revenues are returned to taxpayers so the government doesn't end up accumulating a surplus for other purposes. And if the Minister of Finance does not produce a plan and introduce legislation to make sure that happens, the minister has to refund 50% of salary for that fiscal year. <laughs> um, another market-based based approach we could consider. <laughs> um, it's simple, it's comprehensive, it's straightforward, and it's quick. The law was enacted in late May of 2008. It was in effect um, less than two months later. And the tax has proven to be politically bulletproof in the parliamentary elections this spring. In terms of uh, other ill effects of the cap and trade system that we are against, uh, profiting from the permit price is a significant problem. These are ways in which corporations can actually continue to benefit at the expense of communities. Emission permits are priced to create a market signal that facilities must pay uh, the public for the CO2 pollution. And when the government gives polluters uh, these permits for free, corporations avoid paying for their actions. And that is exactly what is happening under the bills that are going forth, the cap and trade bills that are going forth right now. I think when you look at this overall and you realize that uh, vulnerable communities, those that are on the front line of climate change, are looking at a bill that does not reduce CO2 fast enough at the right targets, does not provide protection for them from vulnerable uh, shocks in the electric market and the energy market, does not control for pollution hotspots, does not provide other types of consumer protection, barely provides any money for training uh, to the green economy, ultimately we're looking at a bill that not only is not good economically, it is not good environmentally, and for those of us in vulnerable communities, it certainly means that it is not good for us at all. In addition to that, our carbon charge proposal puts forth options for recycling the revenue that's raised through the carbon charge into the economy in multiple ways, through training, through offsets that we consider important for allowing for education, allowing for green job and research and, and uh, green job research and development uh, monies to go into green jobs and green jobs technology, and a variety of other things that also deal with public health. The Waxman Markey bill has already passed the House, so they've made it one hurdle. And I was wondering, do you think it's better? that something happens rather than nothing with climate change. I unequivocally think it would be better for Waxman Markey to go down, to not be passed. Um, I think it's an empty achievement. I think it will delay real action on climate change. Um, I think it will also, as its adverse effects become clear because the public is not prepared for it, I think it will cause, could cause a backlash against climate change efforts. This is 
checking a political box without the substance. I think there's some fundamental key differences between the acid rain program and what's uh, up on the table at this particular point. One is that the acid rain program really had a fairly direct and clear path to what needed to be fixed. So there was a way forward. You had to put scrubbers on and you, you know, sol the low sulfur coal, uh, convert to that and then get yourself in that program. Um, in terms of the cap in the acid rain program, it was uh, an allocation for a cap was based upon a, s a standard established in the Clean Air Act, which from my standpoint is one of the strongest environmental laws that we have because it actually does tie into public health. Um, there were no offsets in the acid rain program, and uh, I think that's really critical for those couple of things that I just cited there. It's critical for people to understand. Um, the last thing I'll say about the acid rain program is that the scope of that program was significantly smaller than what we're talking about right now, so that enforceability, which is a key concern for the environmental justice community, uh, is something that we could literally wrap our arms around. I mean, we could get you know, to the, to the source of the problem. What we're talking about here when we talk about a cap and trade program, it's, it's much broader, it's much, you know, it's an economy-wide system and it, it is something that I think uh, should not be compared so easily. Um, a lot of the folks uh, on the cap and trade side like to banty about, oh, well, the acid rain program worked. Well, it worked for very specific reasons and stop pulling the wool over the public's eyes. Uh, just to put this whole debate in a little bit of perspective, uh, when we um, had a strategy meeting at Friends of the Earth in January, this was after the December briefing that we had with uh, both Dr. Hansen and Dr. Shapiro and others, uh, we sort of looked ahead at what we might reasonably be able to expect to do this year. And I think Pretty much we had the consensus, there was a consensus there that as much as the arguments were on our side for the carbon tax or pricing carbon, this year the political reality was is that cap and trade was going to predominate. But our job was to keep on reminding people about the plan B that was there in the wings. And it seems to me that pretty much what we thought would happen has happened. Uh, but let's keep in mind that the bill that passed the Congress passed with the barest possible plural plurality, excuse me, a tremendously compromised bill. And if we step back for a second, I think we should accept the fact that we're actually in a fairly good position now to be pursuing the agenda for carbon B, for Plan B, and that we really it's incumbent upon us to work as best as we can with the Senate, with the conference, and also the fact that let's accept that we may not have a climate bill, regardless of Copenhagen this year, and we should be back next year, really presenting ourselves with a much stronger plan. So I, I think that. Uh, this is not a time, you know, certainly it's discouraging to see such a weak bill put forward there. So many people saying, oh, this is a step forward, would many of us think it's a step backwards. But if we look at it from a broad perspective, um, it's really more time than, uh, timely than ever to be pushing for what is really a viable, equitable alternative. And I think uh, the people here today have spoken very well to that fact.